good morning, good morning, morning, morning. If everybody wants to take a seat and we'll go ahead and get started again. How many of you are feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now? Did, <laughs> <laughs> Diane, I saw that your hand was the first one up. <laughs> and you're not new, come on. Okay, um, don't, get, don't get too uh, caught up in, oh my God, I've got to memorize all this. Remember, Bear and I are always here to help out. What we want to do is just give you a nice framework to say, okay, I, where is this? Oh yeah, they talked about the IMS page. Let me go there first. And then scope around in that. Um, you know, you will be getting your manuals. There will be lots and lots of, of reference for you, resources for you. So don't get too caught up in feeling like I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. And, and that's okay. Very often we used to have it before we used to have these new coordinator trainings, we would just do the main trainings for each test. And by the end of it, people were like, oh my God, we're hoping that this just gives you when you do come to the next test training that the, ac you know, the acronyms, the, the isms, and all of that won't be so foreign. And you'll say, okay, yeah, I remember that when Cindy or Bear was talking about that in the new coordinator training. So just relax. Everything is going to be fine. As I said, I've never lost a test coordinator yet. Came close, but uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and get started again. Wrapping up testing. So you've kind of been through the testing process. There is still a lot of stuff you need to do at the end of the testing. The first one is retrieving your test bins. It is critical that those test bins should not leave a room until that teacher has made sure they are all there. Um, one of the biggest things for this movement back to paper is tracking those booklets. And we'll be giving you lots of information and hopefully maybe have a new way for you to track those booklets by the time we get to that point. But you need to account for every one of those test booklets. That is a big part of the security. And if the state doesn't get a book back, a letter comes back to our office saying, we are missing these booklets and you better be able to account for them. So it is critical that every point that those change hands, they get counted and double checked so that you make sure you still have all of those booklets in place. Because what happens if there's just a missing booklet and nobody knows where it is? All those test items are now out in public, chances. Or there, there is out, a chance. I want to point out the last year we did not have any missing booklets. Okay. So we would like to keep that going. <laughs> it's much harder when there's a lot more booklets out in circulation, but we think you guys can do it. Okay? So um, the testing bins come back. You want to give them explicit directions for repacking that bin. Don't just let them throw all of the stuff back in the bins. That's going to make your job harder. And it's a lot easier for 10 teachers to make sure that, okay, I've got 25 booklets. Yes, 25, they're here, whatever order you want in them, making sure they're separated out by to be scored and not to be scored. You'll hear that a lot. There's two different types of test booklets, one that gets scored and one that doesn't get scored, not to be scored, okay? And we'll be tell talking a lot more about that, but give them specific instructions for sending things back. It'll make your job a lot easier. And then the test administrator or test coordinator designee must sign to verify that all materials were returned and accounted for. That way, you have an idea if something does come up missing, you know where in the cycle it came up missing because you've got a lot of books going out to lots of different rooms, lots of different people. And if you don't do that and all of a sudden you count and booklet 23 is missing, where do you go to check? If you know the minute it's missing, 
that it was the last person that had it was Mrs. Jones in her classroom, you can then go back to Mrs. Jones' classroom right then and find it sometimes in the trash can, sometimes underneath another pile of books, uh, uh, all different kinds of places. But you will find it if you know right when it's missing. If you wait to two days later to count the booklets back from the teachers, what happens in that two days? Trash gets picked up, Mrs. Jones takes those books home and it ends up underneath a pile of magazines at her house, all different kinds of things. We, you know, our first option is not somebody stole the booklet. Chances are it's just, it didn't get handled quite properly and so it's not quite in the right place. But if you find that out immediately, your chances of recovering it are very great. Two days later, not so much. Okay, once all the bins are accounted for and returned to the testing office, it's time to unpack those bins. This is a big job and you are going to need space for this. So um, be thinking about that now because you've also got access for L's, which is another big paper-based test. This is going to be big for you guys because you've got three through five or three through eight if you're a K-8 school, or three through seven rather. Uh, no, three through six. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta get this in my head. Okay, three through six. So it is very important that you've got space. You can't do it in something like this. You can't spread out to be scored, not to be scored, makeups, you know, all of your different things. You've got to have some space. Even if you get some temporary tables are fine, but this is actually a picture of, I'm sure, but your office, right? Or, or that's your office when he was doing it. Now he was at a big high school, so that may be a little bit excessive for an elementary school, but not by much, okay? You've still got to have space to spread things out. Um, so start thinking about that now. You may want to scope out maybe an unused room or, you know, now, or an unused portable before it gets gotten rid of and say, I'm going to need some space for these materials. How about if I move my office here? Now, again, you don't want to get it too far out in the boonies to make it easy for transporting and all that kind of thing. So you just have to sort of think about those things. Um, again, implement, as you're counting things in, implement stop and checks and blind counts. You, you can't count these booklets too many times. Counting them once to 25 is not enough. You need to have at least a secondary count, preferably a third count. And then before everything goes in the boxes, you wanna count them one more time and make sure you have everything in order. One of the things that some people feel is excessive, I think it's a great idea is to put them back into numerical order. If something is missing, that makes it a lot easier to find out what's missing. And it's also very evident what's missing as soon as it comes up that you're missing a number. Okay, the stop and check, it's a process where test booklets, demographic sections are double checked for accuracy and completion. Again, you are not checking through the book, you are only checking that demographic page. You're making sure that all of the information is there, the label is in the right place, that you know everything looks like it should. Big check here is did they fill in the do not score bubble? Kids love filling out bubbles if they're bored, um, not for a test, but for other reasons. And many times we've had booklets that can't be scored because that DNS bubble, uh, DNS stands for do not score. So if you invalidate a test, if, you, um, if the student gets sick and never finishes a test, it gets that bubble on it and they know not to score it. Okay, kids love filling that in. So you gotta make sure that the books that should have that, it's on it, and the books that shouldn't have it, it's not bubbled in. 
Blind counts. Two or more individuals count secure test materials. They do it independently without telling each other and then make sure that they both came up with the same count. Um, again, stop and check each booklet. The legible pre-ID label. Um, we just came back from the state meeting where the state gives us a lot of information. Uh, one of the things we had was a presentation by DRC, Data Recognition Corporation, which is the company, it's only one or two in the country that does this, but they're the ones that collect all these books, send them through the scanners for scoring. They, they accept them, they cut the spines off the booklets, and they all go through scanners. So um, one of the big problems are labels that are not legible. So if you have a label and your printer was starting to run out of ink, or if before it dried it got smudged, you may want to put another label on that because that maybe cannot be read. What happens is you might get that score eventually, but those kinds of things, if a booklet is kicked out of the process, do they sit there and try to fix it right then? Uh -uh. They put that in a fix file or a, I can't remember what they called Problem it. Problem cart. Problem cart, okay? It'll go back and it waits until the very end of the process before they go back and look at that again, okay? What happens is then they will go back, try to figure out what's wrong with it, try to fix it. Sometimes I get a call about it. They will fix it, and then it goes through the process, but it is too late to go into the regular reporting. It's going to go into late reporting. It may or may not be included in your school grade that way. <coughs> Excuse me. So just make sure that you double check these things, and if you're in question about whether you need to fix something, give us a call. We'll let you know. <coughs> Again, blind counts, give to independent people. Just ask them to come in and count the books. Totally independent of you guys. I don't know about you, but when you're dealing with a lot of books like that and you start working with them and I've counted something three times and ended up with three different numbers, you know, you just, you get, you start to get tired and by this time you will be tired. So bring in two fresh people and just say, would you just count these for me? And it, it's a really good triple check on that. Okay, um, packing up test materials. Never, never, never use masking tape. Barrington hates masking tape. He wishes it never had been invented. <laughs> Remember that these boxes have a long trip between your office and where they're eventually going to get. Um, they're going to go via either FedEx or UPS. It's not going to be pretty. You need to think about making sure that, think that there's fragile items in there, okay? Try to get the box so that it's packed up full of books. If it's not, throw extra paper in there, you know, crunch up paper, or um, we'd rather not have peanuts. Peanuts are another thing that, if you've ever messed with them and opened a box with peanuts and didn't realize peanuts were there, you wish they'd never been invented. You know, you're picking them up for days. Um, but, you know, there's bubble wrap, a lot of times bubble wrap will come in the boxes. Please save that. You know, we're not asking you to go out and buy new bubble wrap. But if you need to, crunch some paper up so the boxes are full. Because remember, we're stacking them on pallets that are like six foot high. So it could be as many as five boxes on top of that box. Um, packing tape. Make sure you've got that ordered. I would order a roll of six. You know, they just come in shrink wrap packages of six and hide it so that it's there for your use and a, and a packing tape gun. Um, two things that you really should not be without. But never, never, never use scotch tape or masking tape. You will get a, a call from Bear and said, what were you thinking? <laughs> no, he won't do that, but. The reason why we say not to use masking tape is because there's no AC in the warehouse. 
So when moisture gets to the boxes, the first thing that fails is the masking tape. <clears throat> now what you don't want is a box of 50 test booklets to open up in the process. And then now you are down because for whatever reason, when they go back to pack the boxes, there's 48 test booklets in there and they can't explain why they're missing two, two yeah. test booklets. Again, it's just making sure that, that your stuff gets from point A to point B without it, with the least chance of problems. Okay, at the close of the testing window, um, we pick the materials up from your school. Um, please, please always have your boxes ready. Think about the end of the test window, your last day of testing, you've got to make the time to get your materials ready. Don't scrimp on that because you want to know that your materials are ready, but please make sure they are in your front office the morning or even the evening before they're ready. Now don't just leave them out on the, you know, on top of a counter or something, but you want to make sure that they are ready to go so as soon as the a truck driver arrives your materials are ready if you do not if you miss your pickup date we will not go back and pick it up again we pay for every pickup whether they pick the boxes up or not that we do our warehouse is a uh, what's called an enterprise system our department actually gets a bill for everything they do for us and that includes these pickups so to go out to your school, if your boxes aren't ready, they come back, I still get charged for that, okay? And so we can't go back and just, you know, say, okay, yeah, we'll go back. Um, <coughs> if you don't, if you miss your pickup, the picture there is actually a picture of the warehouse. The um, left-hand side of that is gift for teaching. The left side of that building that's just off screen that's a gift for teaching and that bay door that's open there is well actually that's not the bay door no, is it it's, it's the, the bay door is right. a little bit on the where are far, you guys the, the far, far right, right. Yes. is the one to the far right where bear will probably be uh if you have to deliver them okay um we cannot tell you what day we're going to pick up or what time we are going to pick up you all live in Orlando, you know what traffic's like. These drivers are driving all around your area and depending on the traffic, depending on accidents, depending on the, the construction, you never know. But we can't give you a specific time because if you are here at the end of the route on the far right-hand side of your area and he's ending on the far left side, it, it just doesn't, they can't do that. Okay, so just know that when you get your pickup, they have to be ready that first day. We don't know when they are going to be picked up, actually. Okay, percent tested. This is a biggie. Everybody wants to know that they hit that 95 mark. Um, they require for you to get a school grade that you test at least 95% of, of your school. To accomplish this, you need to make sure that you maintain attendance reports. I guarantee you that your principal is going to come to you the first after the first day of testing or even in the middle of the first day of testing, and they're going to say, how much, how much, uh, what was our percentage? Okay. There's some ways that you can do that, but you need to know how many kids didn't show up for testing. Uh, participation reports or on the computer um, there is information if you click on that link when you download the um, uh, the PowerPoint that's a live link and there are um, some information on estimating your percent tested because remember it's not the percent tested of a hundred percent of your kids but if you measure a hundred percent of your kids and say you got to 98 percent of 100 percent of your current kids what does that mean if i take a mess of those kids out of there chances are you will have met 
the 95% threshold for the kids that do count towards your school grade. That's the important thing that your principal wants to know because those are kids that match on survey two, survey three. You've heard about the whole thing with accountability in school grade. That's a whole different office from us, but, and there's lots of rules. And if you want to know more about that, you can contact the accountability office, but that's what they're really talking about. So, invalidations in NR codes. Um, basically, in testing irregular, irregularity generates or means that the scores will be invalidated. This is cheating. Um, a student gets sick during testing. A student was disruptive during testing. Um, and there's lots of different ways that can happen. Um, again, if you have questions about an invalidation, please give us a call, especially the first time they happen. We're happy to talk it over with you. I guarantee you that during the testing window, Barrington and I are sitting at our desks up on the seventh floor from the, you know, seven o'clock in the morning until generally five or six at night. We are there to talk to you to, to help you through this. Um, there's lots of other reasons a test might not get scored. Now this is coming through, these NR codes are coming through on the actual reports that you get back. The NR code, meaning not reported code, NR2 is did not meet attemptedness. That means that a student didn't answer enough questions to get a score. Generally that is somewhere in, five, in the five question mark of a singular session, they have to answer at least the first five questions in order for it to generate a score. Um, if they only answer two questions, it will not generate a score because there's not enough data for them to make a determination that this is what the student did. Um, NR3 is marked do not score. NR5, that means that the student took a test that was below their grade level. So if they were at a level five, they were fifth grade, but say they were in a fourth grade classroom and they got the wrong test, they will not score that. They do not allow you to score below grade level. NR6 is a duplicate record. This is something we can generally fix. Those others will not be scored. But if it's a duplicate record, this generally happens if for whatever reason you took a test and you transferred the items. In the case of the highlighter and you transferred the items to another test, then you forgot to DNS the first test. So there's, there are actually two tests that they're trying to score. Don't necessarily have to have the same score. But that will require in us to intervene and say, okay, and what will happen is I will get a call or Bear will get a call and we'll try to work through it, in which case I'll probably call you. And that's why you always need to keep those records of your testing, make notes, make, you know, whatever you need to do to remember what happened um, because we're going to call you and say what happened with Johnny Smith's record. He's got two different tests here. Okay, the NR, uh, NR7 is an FDOE hold. Um, that generally means something's odd about what they see on this and they wanna ask questions before they release the score. Again, they will call us, I will probably call you. Doesn't happen a lot, very rarely, but just so you're aware of this, so that when it comes through, and one of the things when you first get that first roster of scores, um, it's a spreadsheet with all of your kids and all the scores. That's what you will receive first when you get scores. That'll have those codes on it if a student is, does not get a score. The other code you will see is NT. That just means they didn't get a test for that student. Nothing was turned in for that student. Okay, the last one is NR8. We don't see this very often at the elementary school. We see it a lot more often at the high, 
at high school and middle school. <clears throat> NRA basically means that these two tests were so similar that both the right answers and the wrong answers that they do not believe that these tests were taken independently of each other. Now, we aren't saying that the kids cheated, but something happened that kept us from believing that these scores were independent of each other. Generally, what happens is you will then get, you'll get a list of kids or a kid, usually, well, it's always two kids, together. You'll first off look at the seating chart. In 99.9% .9 of the cases, those kids are sitting right next to each other. If you look at the data that you will get with an NR8, if you look across to the very end of the spreadsheet, it gives you the percent matched. Generally, what we see that goes anywhere from about 70 to 80% to 100% match, both wrong and right answers, okay? Um, it's pretty evident when you look at it that something was going on. Either the teacher was not paying attention and didn't see this go on. Concerns me when I see 100% match, because that means the kids were looking the whole test, okay? I, that would require me to sit down with the teacher and say, you know, Johnny and Susie, their answers were identical. They both got invalidated. The only way to get that to go through is if one student says, I was looking on Susie's paper and she didn't know about it. Occasionally that does happen, not very often, but occasionally. That is really the only way that a test will be uninvalidated on an NRA. Okay, there is a process to go through. You will get the information when you do get, if you get an NRA. Again, it doesn't happen very often at an elementary school. I think I've seen it happen two or three times at an elementary school. Okay, quiz time. How come I got all the quizzes? <laughs> okay, test your knowledge. Before boxing up materials, which tasks must be completed? Select all that apply. Blind counts, stop and check. Verify that students bubbled their answers correctly. Create stations for sorting security documents, test booklets, and other testing bin contents. Is A correct? Raise your hand. A correct. Is B correct? Yes. Is C correct? No. Nope. Never, never, never check to see the students' answers. You cannot erase anything. You're not supposed to look to say, gosh, I want to know how my kids did, and open up their booklets and just kind of look. And usually, especially at elementary school, you know enough that you can tell whether they answered correctly. Please do not do that. That is a security violation. And number D, create stations for sorting test security documents, test booklets, and other testing big complex. Is that true? Yes. Okay, good job. Yep, A, B, and D. Okay. Now we're looking at your testing office, and I alluded to this a little bit when we talked about space. Location, location, location. Your office should be somewhere centrally located to your school's campus. Um, you don't want to be back in the netherworld at the very back end of the, um, of your, um, if, if you are in a portable, please try to not be in the very, very, very back. What that, that's just hard for you because if you need to visit a classroom during testing, you need to be able to get there quickly if there is some kind of problem. Remember, your busiest day, now it's not where you may do the most work, but your busiest day is the first day of testing. That's where you're gonna have the most calls, the most, oh my God, this just happened. Hmm? Everything's fine, we can handle that. Um, the kid decides to throw up in the middle of the classroom. You got to get a booklet down there, or you've got to go make sure the custodian gets down there, clean it up ASAP so that the rest of the class 
<coughs> can continue testing. Anyway, just, just kind of look around. It should be somewhere centrally located. No more than three people should have access to your office. Okay, this includes the custodial staff. Now, don't do anything about rekeying any doors yet. We've had a lot of pushback from facilities, but we just got the information, and luckily, our associate superintendent was at the state meeting and heard that only three people can have access to wherever the testing materials are being stored. So I think she's going to go up against facilities and say, we have to have this done. When we're ready, we will contact you to say, okay, if you need your keys, your door rekeyed, now is the time to put it in, and then they will get to all of those, okay? But it is very important that that get done before testing. If you do have any problems once we give the okay to do that, let us know. Um, and as Bear says, let's face it, you're going to spend a lot of time in there. Um, you'll need space to store the boxes, pencils, calculators, dictionaries, reams of paper, tissue boxes. There will be tears, whether they're yours or maybe a teacher or even a kid. Um, the testing bins, tables for workspaces, a comfortable chair. Um, again, we want you to be comfortable doing what you're doing because you're going to be doing a lot of it. Um, you'll need a desk or a dry erase wall calendar. That is very, very helpful. If you look at bears in my office, if you ever get up there, but feel free to poke your head in, I've got four, uh, two dry erase boards with four months each. I have eight months of calendar on my wall that's visible from Bear's office as well. So we've got all of the test dates on there, all important dates, dates when we might be out, so that we can really keep track of what's going on and nothing sneaks up on us. It still does sometimes, but it should lessen that. Um, consider a desktop paper cutter for cutting out test tickets. You don't want to be doing that with a scissor. Many times that kind of stuff can be picked up at the surplus office, okay? And there's no cost to it. If possible, request a dual computer monitor for your office. Um, you can use multiple programs at the same time, especially when you're pulling files off of EDW and SMS and that kind of thing. And when you start merging those files, it really makes that a much easier process. And if the principal asks about it, just have them give Bear or I a call and we will say that, yes, this really is, makes your job much easier. Treat your office as Fort Knox. Um, Really, really and truly. You should not be having lunches in there with other teachers. Um, you can have lunch in there, but your door should be locked at all times. Just get in the habit. Um, don't just do it when you know there's testing boxes there, because if you don't do it on a regular basis, you'll forget about it when it's important to do it. Um, again, avoid permitting teachers to congregate in your office. I know that's hard sometimes. Um, ideally, if you had a separate, you know, sometimes there's a front office and then there's a door to where you've got everything stored. If that can be locked, that's fine. But again, you just want to make sure you're always treating it as if you have secure materials in there, whether you do or not. Okay. The Starting lineup. Okay, the school assessment, the, the school assessment team. Um, you've got a lot of people. You can't do this on your own. Okay, you are the coach. You are the person that's sort of running things, especially those first couple of days of testing. Once you get to the point of doing makeups. You can participate in that. If you've got two kids to make up, there's no reason you can't do it. But day one and two of testing on the reading, you need to be available to answer questions, to help solve problems, 
to give us a call if you have if you need help or if you have questions you can't be in the classroom testing you are the coach you are not out on the football field okay and you need to sort of rally those folks you need to make sure that you are always giving very clear directions to what needs to be done um, and again everyone um, isn't going to be on board with this either some team members may be proved difficult be ready for that uh, make student-centered decisions think about the kid uh, what's right for that kid uh, collaborate by all means if you if it's coming up to the point that you might need to invalidate something talk to the teacher that was involved get as much information as you can then you can make your decision if you still need aren't sure give bear and i a call um, consult your principal or supervisor administrator before sending any mass communications out one of the hardest things to recover from is if you send something out to all parents or district-wide to all your crt friends and it turns out it was wrong it's embarrassing for you it can cause a lot of problems because it's misinformation so be very careful about sending out mass communication if you send out a wrong date to parents <coughs> or wrong information to parents that can be tough now you do need to do that sometimes um, you need to communicate with uh, your parents about testing time good testing practices the day before testing getting good night's sleep eating a good breakfast all those kinds of things um, you want to make sure that you're keeping them informed so you can do that through collaboration with guidance counselors connect orange messages parent newsletter all kinds of things but just make sure um, i just recently sent out an email um, which was wrong because i was busy bear was busy and i didn't get it proofed well enough and i said the secondary meeting was on tuesday it was actually on on wednesday it was actually on thursday and i said the times were wrong and we didn't catch it and i should have known better i should have said no nope, we're both too busy and i should have given it to my super proofer back there jeanette and i didn't so you know and then i had to go out and send correction emails and it was a big problem so don't get caught with that if you aren't absolutely sure even if you are sure get somebody else to proof your stuff before you send out mass mailings um you'll you'll thank me in the long run quiz time again okay oops oh access to the testing officer should be equivalent to security at which of the following locations this is not a secure test because he gave you the answer <laughs> should be the vault to a bank you know you limit access you make sure it's locked up um, so that you know you don't going to have a problem with those materials and with that i want to turn this back to bear i think we're getting on our last leg here we're almost done so in addition to organizing when kids are going to be testing, which kids need to test, where they're going to test, all that good stuff. You also need to maintain documents that basically prove that you've been organizing everything. These documents have to be saved because in the event that there's an investigation, the state needs to see proof that you followed protocols. Now, before I came um, to the district office, what we used to do is we would get um, in the manual directions for what's called the district assessment coordinator only box. And in that you'd put all your seating charts, your rosters and all your other documents in the box. We would pick them up, they'd go to the warehouse, they'd get stored there and then heaven forbid there's an investigation, somebody would have to drive down to the warehouse, pull the pallet down, look for the box, 
open the box, then find whatever documents the state was asking for. When I got here, I decided, hmm, there has to be an easier way. So what we do now is we upload your secure documents to um, basically our server so that in the event that there is an investigation, I can easily, or Cindy can easily go on to the server, find the documents that you uploaded, and produce them for the investigation. Um, we do have a guide that's on the IMS page that walks you through the process for the handling of these documents. There are three ways to scan and upload your documents. Um, the first one is scan to a USB drive to the copier. The next one is scan to your email and then upload it. Or if you don't have one of the big copiers at your school, you just have one of those desktop scanners, you can scan them and then save them directly to your computer. Because you guys will have so many documents that need to be scanned, I definitely recommend using the scan to USB drive method. It will save you tons of time and it will make your life much easier. Once you scan your documents, you're gonna go online and complete this form. Um, generally, the deadline to scan and upload your documents is a week after the window has ended. We know that come May, you will have basically rolling testing windows. So we recommend that at least by the, the weekend, or not the weekend, the Friday before Memorial Day, that you have those documents um, uploaded and scanned and uploaded. Um, in the guide, this is one of my favorite pages. It basically tells you which documents um, you need to store, how long to store them. It also tells you what you need to keep in your records, what can be shredded and gotten rid of, et cetera, and also what you can recycle. Here are the test security forms that you are responsible for for each administration. Um, you have your administration record and security checklist. This is a document that you will be tracking your test booklets with. You have the security log, chain of custody form, which I have mentioned before, your test administrator prohibited activities agreement, and the test administration and security agreement. The administration record and checklist is found in the back of your manual. In the spring, we also provide uh, Excel version of this to make your life way, way easier, especially now that you will be doing so much more paper-based testing. On this document, basically you have to put the student's name, uh, flea ID number, all of that good stuff, and the test booklet. What I recommend that you do is one of two things. If you don't want to end up with arthritis or a sore wrist from having to write hundreds and hundreds of flea ID numbers and security numbers on a test booklet, and then again on the security checklist, is to have your school invest in one of those handheld barcode scanners. If your principal doesn't want to buy one because he or she has a tight budget, the next person you want to become friends with is your media specialist. Each of your media specialists has a handheld barcode scanner for when they're checking out books. So you may have to go in after school or when the uh, media center is quiet and borrow the scanner. Now essentially what you would do is you would get the test booklet on your spreadsheet, find Barrington Maxwell, you have Barrington Maxwell's um, test booklet, scan the barcode for the security number and it will go into your uh, spreadsheet. And that's how you will have the um, security book number for that student. It'll save you time. You'll just click, scan, grab the next book, click, scan, and keep going down until you are done. The next document is the security log. This tracks who has access to the materials. It does not necessarily track who is responsible for the materials. So for example, when you are testing, each test administrator, each room needs to have a security log. If somebody comes in to, I mean, there's 
tons of reasons why people need to come to the room. So let's say you're testing and while testing is going on, there is an issue in the room. Let's say um, the AC isn't working and the custodian or repair person needs to come into the room or let's say your school's internet goes down while there's testing. Now, of course, you're going to be doing paper-based testing, but that individual may need to come in and check the room. Anytime they come in there, they need to sign the security log. It doesn't mean that they're responsible for testing. It just means that they were in the room while test materials were in the room as well. You need to sign it if you're going in the room to provide any assistance. Your test administrator and proctor need to sign it anytime they are in the room. When they leave, they sign out. If they come back after a restroom break, they sign back in. The chain of custody form. This tracks um, when the materials arrived at your school, who has access to them. Remember those three people with key access? They get listed here in case the state needs to find out who had access to that room. Also, when they are leaving, not just your office, but leaving the school to come back to Cindy and I, you then indicate that they are no longer in your custody. You are sending them out. Seating chart, very, very, very important. Seating chart, of course, shows where students were seated during testing. Um, the layout should reflect the arrangement of the room. So for example, this particular seating chart was from a um, testing lab. Notice how the numbers are arranged and where the teacher's desk is, and it also shows the direction the students are facing for testing. If you need to make any changes, for example, let's say um, it's a makeup session or you need to move a kid because um, there's an issue with another student, then make sure that your test administrators know to go in and make the change on the seating chart. I always recommend using pencil in case you need to make any erasures on the seating chart. This is a copy of the Test Administrator Prohibited Activities Agreement. A copy is found in the back of every manual, so you want to make sure that at the end of your trainings that you conduct at your school sites, that your test administrators sign this document and that you keep it for your records. They only need to sign one per year. Um, there are a few exceptions. CFE has a different form, even though it looks very similar to this they must also sign that one as well. The other document is the Test Administration and Security Agreement. This is signed by both your proctor and the test administrator. And then of course, this document only needs to be signed one time for the year. And then of course, you will keep it for your records as well. Um, the TDM security document guide was created to A, eliminate the need for the DACO box, B, decrease days at the warehouse, C, make retrieving test security documents faster, D, streamline management of test security documents. I'm gonna feel that, now there are multiple answers, multiple correct answers. Is A one of the correct answers? Okay, how about B? All right, that is correct. B is not gonna decrease the days I have to spend at the warehouse by you uploading documents. C, retrieving, okay, D, yes, okay, good job. All right, and here's the final, final homework stretch um, where Cindy is going to wrap up with testing platforms. Okay, final, final one, testing platforms. Okay, um, even though as an elementary school you're not doing computer-based testing, you still need to be familiar with these platforms. There are a couple that you don't test on them, but you need to keep um, the records on them. So let's talk about these. Pearson Access Next. Um, these are for the NGSSS assessments. This one you will use for science at the elementary school. If you're a KH, you will also use it for um, civics, you will actually test on the platform for civics. You would also um, use it if you're at the high school. I think I might have a few high schools. Um, you would use this for 
um, the other NGSSS EOCs. So for science, what you would do is keep track of the kids testing with science and for new kids who were not in the system when we pre-ID'd, you would need to add them so you can print a label for them. The same is true for TIDE. Um, that is for all uh, the FSA assessments. There's also UNIFI for the local assessments and CFEs. And then there's the WIDA website for Access for L's. Now, the only one you're really using for testing students is UNIFI. Um, you've also got Flickers, but since we've already done the training for that, that's almost over. So you should be just about done with that one. Okay, Pearson Access Next. It's ac accessed. I'm sorry, what? They told us not to start until now. They told us not to start. Um, They're just not started Flickers. Oh, you're just now, right. You should be just now going into it, right? I'm sorry, you shouldn't be through it. But <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I just meant you'd already been trained for it. <laughs> sorry. I'm ready to stop talking about testing, too. <laughs> OK. Um, you use this through Pearson Access Next. You always want to use Google Chrome to access this. We call it PAN for short. Not Peter, but just Pan. Test coordinators are given the CBT coordinator role. Now, you will get access to this. If you don't have it already, you will get access to this. And you will be sent an email from Pearson Access Next when we set up your account. And then you set up your own password for it. We, your username is always your email address. OK? If you have any problems with any of these access, you can contact Jeanette, and she'll help you through either resetting your account or setting up an account if somehow you, did, you got mixed, uh, missed. Again, you will create student accounts on this, prepare for testing, and print test labels. The other thing you will do on PAN is to view your score report. So when the scores come out, initially come out for testing for the science, they will come through and you will go sign into PAN and you will download the roster of student results. It will not be the individual student reports, but it will be a list of all of your kids and their scores. Um, you can um, set up test sessions in Pearson Access if you're at a middle school or a um, high school or you're a K-8. You can set up test sessions for testing um, for your civics test at middle school or the other NGSS tests that are tested on PAN. So some changes to PAN will be coming. We did get some information about this at the state meeting just last week. Um, we will be going when we actually do the training for the science. And for the EOCs, we will let you know about the changes that are coming and that might affect you. Okay, nothing you need to worry about right now. The other one is Tide. No, it is not. You're what you use laundry. I use all, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Tide is the platform that we use for FSA. It is www.fsassessments.com. Dot org. Um, again, use Google Chrome to access it. That's where it works best. And again, you have the CBT coordinator role. This one, you use just about the same information as you get from Pearson Access Next, and they do look very different. Um, you create student accounts for students that were not already pre-ID'd, and you need a label for them. You print labels. You generate participation reports. TIDE is not used to administer the assessments. It's only to just work on getting that information in the system so that when they do the scoring, everything matches up and the reports come out correctly. Again, there's a user guide for both of these. There's a Pearson Access 
next user guide out on that system. And there is a user guide for the FSA portal. Um, there will be TIDE training, just like there will be Pearson training when that gets a little closer to spring training. Unify. Um, Unify is the app in Performance Matters. It's used to create formative assessments and to administer the common final exams and the PMAs, correctly? Well, PMAs are paper-based. Oh, that's right. PMAs are paper-based. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so they, they are used to administer the common final exams. The information is in there about PMAs, however. Um, it's found on the Performance Matters page via the Research Accountability and Grants IMS page. So you've got to go all the way back to the beginning of our, our session here and um, think about those IMS pages we showed you. Um, there is a Performance Matters page. Um, and you use your network convention, credentials for to get on the Unify. Both Ty Pearson and the WIDA site have separate logins. They do not use your um, OCPS credentials. Unif WIDA is the one that you use to um, set up access for ELS test. You do the training in WIDA for your teachers. There is training for both you and uh, training sites for both you and your teachers on the WIDA.us. And then there is a WIDA.AMS site where you will download the reports when they finally come out. Oh my God, whose brain is full? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we just gave you a whole big lot of information. Uh, before I, come on, stop. It's supposed to stop when I put my hand on it. <laughs> okay, um, before we go to questions, let me just give you this. So you have it, you've got, should have the blue sheet, um, component number 300, 306. And you get four points for the training today. When you leave, if you will send that, uh, give that to Jeanette in the back, there's also pencils back there. But before that, let's go ahead and open it for questions, questions that you have. Yes, ma'am. Um, and, and speak up. What did, did you hear that? Yes. Sorry, I'm a bit hard of hearing. <laughs> so she said that she missed the portfolio training. Um, that is actually handled by the curriculum department. The person you want to reach out to for information about portfolios is Michelle Platzer, and she can let you know about any upcoming trainings or how to get the information you need. Yeah, generally if it's SML, oh, it's, it's pretty standard practice to record those. Every training that we do on SML and or even our live trainings, we record everything and they will always be available out on our website. In fact, we were recording this one right now and um, probably in a week or two, we'll be able to post it to our website. Yeah, so they're always available for reference um, for you to go back and look at or if anything else, um, or you just want to refresh or if you miss something. Platzer, um, P-L-A-T-Z-E-R. Yeah. Question in the back. And remember, yell. Oh. Teach your voice. Actually, we may have mics. Oh. Oh, she wants to see the component number. Oh, sorry. There we go. All right. Yes, ma'am. Who do we contact if we don't have access to Pearson next? I sent. Um, that will probably come in. If you don't have access, um, Jeanette can set you up an account. I sent her an email already. Am I good? Yes, you're good. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Let me think about this. Flickers, flickers, flickers. No, you don't need them for flickers. Yeah, because they're on the computer. Yeah. And they're recommending small groups, yes. Yes, you can still do flickers in the lab. However, the curriculum department 
and we are supporting them, um, recommends doing smaller um, groups. But if, but if you can't facilitate that and you need to do it in a lab, then by all means, go ahead. Yeah, again, but just make sure you have the support. Yeah, you've got to get, be able to get testing done. And this goes especially for planning. Um, I mean, ideally, every kid could be tested one-on-one. -on -one, you know, and yeah, that would be a fabulous situation for most kids. Um, you know, they'd stay on task, you'd know everything went well, you know, whatever it was. That's not reasonable. So you've still got to get testing done within the time frame that we have to get testing done. There are no extensions for state dates. Once that, once that, the last date of testing is here, that is it. You cannot test after that date. Even if you still have materials, you cannot test after that date. So it's very important for you to realize and know that, okay, I've got this many days, I've got to get it done in that time. And if that means that maybe you put a few more kids together than you would really like to, you still got to get it done. And that's a good point. When you're talking to your ESE teachers, Talk to them and sit down and say, how many kids do you have that you've got one-on-one -on -one testing for? One-on-one -on -one testing becomes a real, can be a real problem sometimes. And so talk to them about how many they have and do those kids really need one-on-one -on -one testing? Because you gotta remember, you gotta have one person, one room for that one kid. And that's really a lot. And if you have a lot of those, it can be a problem. Okay? Any other questions? Say a hand in the back. No, any OCPS employee can be a test administrator for the Access for ELS test. Yes, you will need seating charts. The only portion of the Access for ELSE test you don't need a seating chart for is the speaking portion. But of course, once we do our actual Access for ELSE training, we will go into the specifics of that. Okay, just a little caveat to that. Remember, every school employee can be a test administrator. Not every school employee should be a test administrator. And that goes for teachers as well, okay? If you've got somebody that you are really concerned about, you might wanna to talk to your principal about and think, okay, maybe I'll make this person a proctor or use them with, with me testing, but really should not be responsible because this person is three days from retirement and I know that she's not good, I never mind in the game, and am I concerned about her reading the directions or doing everything correctly? Because remember, Doing things wrong with state tests has consequences. You get things invalidated, it can affect kids going on to the next grade level, it can affect graduation, it can affect school grade. Nobody wants to see that. So you've got the choice to say, this person really should not be a test administrator, I'd rather have them in a different role. I'm sorry? She's asking, do they need to be WIDA certified? Um, they do need to complete the WIDA test administrator training, um, but that when that becomes available, we'll definitely share that as well. I think we fried your brains and that's why you don't have questions. And that's Remember, okay. <laughs> we're always available, not 24 seven, but Close, email, <laughs> um, email is the best way to get us. If you call us and we're not picking up and it's really, really, really important, it's an emergency, shoot us an email and say, Cindy, I really have to talk to you, can you call me? Same with Bear. And then we'll call you back because sometimes we get so busy and we're on the phone a lot and it's not that we're not picking up, it's just that more calls are coming in. So. Don't hesitate to do that if you really, 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 please only do that if you really, really, really need to get a hold of us, but um, we're there for you. No such thing as a stupid question. No such thing as a silly question. You can't ask a question too many. 
And please, please, please don't apologize for asking us questions. We love that. It means you're thinking through the process and you're trying to do it correct. And that's all we care about. Now, one thing is, I know it may be tempting to email both Cindy and I when you have questions. Generally speaking, we prefer that you email just one of us. Uh, let's say you know a few days have gone by, you haven't heard a response, or you get an out of office message, and of course, by all means, email the next one. But so that we're not duplicating efforts, just email one of us. Also, another thing that's also very helpful is on your email in your signature line to include your extension. Um, sometimes if we're not in the office, we see your email, it's very easy, I can call your school, and if I have your extension, I can call you directly. And also put your school, there's a real easy thing in um, Outlook that you can set up a signature line, which is just automatically goes onto the bottom of every email. Please use that, go ahead and put your school name and then your, um, cause that way it's, it's, I can think through, or we can think through, okay, yeah, I remembered I talked to Westridge, especially before we get all of your names ingrained in us and the schools, it really helps to tie you to a school so that I know, okay, yeah, I remember I talked to her about the thing at, that happened at Princeton Elementary or whatever it was. Um, so go ahead and put that and put your extension on there and that really helps us get back to you quicker. Uh, Anything else? All right, well, if you don't have any other questions, we thank you guys for coming. Always reach out to us, as Cindy mentioned before, and Jeanette's in the back to collect your um, sheets. Your sheets. Have a great afternoon, guys. It's a short week. Yay! <laughs>